The fictional family in Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House books, Ma, Pa, Mary, Laura, Carrie, and eventually Grace, were always moving west, from the big woods of Wisconsin to Indian Territory in Kansas, to the banks of Plum Creek in Minnesota, and finally on to Dakota Territory. But for the fictional Laura Ingalls, as well as for the novelist herself, the real West actually began in Dakota Territory, when her family followed the railroad crews who were laying tracks for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad west to Silver Lake. In a chapter entitled, The West Begins, from by the shores of Silver Lake, Wilder writes, the farther they went into the West, the smaller they seemed, and the less they seemed to be going anywhere. The wind blew the grass always with the same endless rippling. The horse's feet and the wheels going over the grass made always the same sound. Laura thought they might go on forever, yet always be in the same changeless place that would not even know they were there. In Wilder's unpublished memoir, Pioneer Girl, which we've discussed earlier, she calls Dakota Territory the great new country. And her autobiographical writing about Dakota Territory is just as vivid as her fiction. I want to reread a passage I've shared with you earlier. The sun sank lower and lower until looking like a ball of pulsing liquid light. It sank gloriously in clouds of crimson and silver. Cold purple shadows rose in the east, crept slowly around the horizon, then gathered above in depth on depth of darkness from which the stars swung low and bright. Wilder admired the turbulent, wild, ambivalent, and sometimes lawless atmosphere she found in Dakota Territory from the very beginning. When Big Jerry rescues the fictional as well as the real Ingalls family, from a menacing writer, you can tell that the fictional Wilder, as well as the writer herself, was entranced right from the beginning. Here's a passage from that memoir. Pa seemed uneasy and kept looking back, Wilder wrote. Then a man on a white horse overtook the other and they came on. Ma didn't like their coming, but Pa said the last man was Big Jerry and everything was all right. Paul went on to say that Jerry was a half-breed, Indian and French, a gambler, some said a horse thief, but a darn good fellow. That was hardly a character reference that would have warmed Caroline Ingalls' more conventional heart. But for Wilder, it came to symbolize the wide open freedom that the Dakota Prairie promised to free spirits like herself and Pa. This is why they both fully embraced the West. It was hard, however, to explain all this, especially to pragmatists like Ma and Mary. In By the Shores of Silver Lake, Pa says, this is a different country. I can't tell you how exactly, but this prairie is different. It feels different. That's likely enough, Ma said sensibly. We're west of Minnesota and north of Indian Territory, so naturally the flowers and grasses are not the same. But that was not what Pa and Laura meant. There was really almost no difference in the flowers and grasses. There was something else that was not anywhere else. It was an enormous stillness that made you feel still. And when you were still, you could feel great stillness coming closer. But into that stillness came wild, extravagant, and memorable characters like Big Jerry and Lena and Jean with their wild black ponies, Cap Garland and that daring wilder boy who braved a blizzard to bring wheat back to a starving town, or the infamous and unhappy Mrs. Bucci, Mrs. Brewster in the novel, waving a butcher knife over her husband in the dark. Wilder transformed these real experiences and more on the Dakota Plains into fictional episodes for her strongest novels, By the Shores of Silver Lake, The Long Winter, The Little Town on the Prairie, and These Happy Golden Years. 
All four of these novels are set in Dakota Territory, what is now South Dakota. All four were Newbery Honor books. We'll talk about the Newbery Honors and Awards later in the semester, but for now, what you really need to know about the Newberries is that they're the Academy Awards of children's literature. And although Wilder didn't actually win the Newbery Medal itself, her editor at Harper and Brothers believed this had nothing to do with the book's literary merits and everything to do with publishing politics. As she wrote in a letter, an influential California librarian told me that they, the Newbery Selection Committee, couldn't even consider any of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books for the Newbery because we don't like series books. Wilder's literary agent also believed these books set in Dakota Territory were her strongest. He wrote Wilder in 1941, if you write for children, then I am in my second childhood. So why are these books so strong? Certainly, in part, it's because of Wilder's lingering love of the Dakota prairies. But it may also have to do with Wilder's age when she arrived there. In 1879, at the age of 12, she was an adolescent coming of age, as her readers of these books would be decades later. Wilder was impressionable, open to new ideas and places, standing on the brink of womanhood. This made her memories more vivid and tangible. Like many writers of young adult novels, she hadn't forgotten what it felt like to be young. In 1938, as she was riding by the shores of Silver Lake, she wrote her daughter Rose that it was perfectly normal for the Laura of the book to daydream, to mull things over. It is a perfectly natural way to see that time. For girls of that age, these dreamy spells did have them, or they did 60 years ago. But Wilder's unique family experiences in 1879 also contribute to the strength of Wilder's memory from this period of her life. In February 1879, just seven months before the Ingalls family moved to Dakota Territory, Mary fell desperately ill and went blind. As Wilder writes in her memoir, it began as a pain in Mary's head, but quickly worsened. She became delirious and so feverish that Ma cut off her long, beautiful hair to keep her head cool. The family feared Mary would not recover. Then she suffered a stroke. Wilder records that one side of Mary's face was drawn out of shape. Although Mary's condition improved after the stroke, her vision began to deteriorate. The last thing Mary ever saw was the bright blue of Grace's eyes, Wilder wrote. At the time, Doctors believed that Mary hadn't fully recovered from measles, which the girls had contracted when the family was living in Burr Oak, Iowa, a period, as we've discussed, that Wilder chose not to write about in her novels. So when the Ingalls family moved to Dakota Territory, both the fictional Laura Ingalls and the real one had a new responsibility to be Mary's eyes. It's important to note that in her memoir, Wilder links this new responsibility to moving west into Dakota Territory. Wilder remembers that she told Mary about everything I saw, for we were on our way again and going in the direction which always brought the happiest changes. 